Holy Lord, with all of my heart I sing. Great are you, Lord, worthy of praise. Great are you, Lord, great are you, Lord, most holy Lord. Our Father and our God, what a privilege it is to be assembled here in the presence of your holy angels and with like-minded believers. Lord, help us not to take these opportunities to worship you for granted. And Lord, we just ask that you would bless the congregation today and prepare our hearts and minds to receive words from your holy writ. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our opening hymn is hymn number six. Oh, worship the Lord, hymn number six. Joyce is going to have our praise and thanksgiving. If you don't mind, Joyce, I'd like to start. Sure. It's kind of more like a testimony. Devin and I went out last Sabbath after potluck, and we passed out some meals. And we passed them out to a few people. But as we were coming down Main Street, there was a gentleman who was screaming at the top of his lungs, waving his arms, and he was just looked like out of control. He was crossing the street and Devin, I said, we should stop and give him one. Devin said, no. And we kept going. <laughs> I said, why? She goes, it makes me uncomfortable. I have my son in the car and he's kind of, wow. So we drove a little bit. We saw three people. We gave him lunches. And I said, we really need to go back, Devin. So she goes, all right, I know you're right. So let's go. So we made a round and we came and he ended up on my side of the, the vehicle. So I opened my window and I said, would you like a lunch? His whole demeanor changed. He said, yes, I would. Thank you. And um, he was just as calm and relaxed. And I said, God bless. And he said, God bless you too. And wow. it was just, it was just so wonderful. Right, Devin? 
Thank you for sharing that, Terry. That was You're wonderful. Welcome. Yes. Well, you know, we need to sing to the Lord and be thankful for all the things that he does for us daily, sometimes hourly. And shout for joy for his righteousness. He is so good to us. And we don't we we don't recognize or we give don't give him enough credit for all that he does. He's gracious, he's long suffering. You know, in Psalms 19, it says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows forth his handiwork. And if we can do that, if the, if the firmament shows forth his goodness and his mercy, how much more we, his creation, are created in his image, how much more we should just give him honor and glory and praise. So we've already had a wonderful testimony from um, Terry. Has anyone else got one that they want to share? I got a quick one. Sure. Well, we we uh, we moved in with my parents a few months ago, and we put our house. Uh, we've been preparing to put our house in the market, but we put our house in the market earlier this week, and we got notice that it had sold uh, yesterday. So pretty pretty quick and uh, short work, but we're very grateful. Yes. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Those are, the, those are the kind of things we like to have happen quickly. Amen. So is there anyone else here with a yes, Julie? Nice to see you, honey. Yes, I do have a praise. My tendonitis in my elbow flared up because I was still I'm still getting settled in and I overdid it. So I'm back in OT again. But I'd like to thank my case manager slash friend, Ashley, for helping me out yesterday for getting my apartment to the way I envisioned it. I mean, yes, I helped her when I can, but most of my apartment is pretty much done, except for the bedroom. That always seems to be the last thing. The bedroom is the next project, but the rest of it is pretty much done. Well, that sounds good, Julie. I'm glad things are working out for you, honey. And I have lots of praises that I want to I want to praise God for. I'm just so thankful for the Bible studies that I'm having with my grandson Noah, and with um, this young lady, uh, Meg. Her name is Meg Stanton. Her we found out that her grandmother was a one of the leaders in the Harrison Church years ago and she went to church with her when she was a little girl and so as we're taking these studies she's remembering things that she learned from her grandmother and I just praise the Lord for that and I'm expecting that things are going to go well with her but then she just found out that she's pregnant and she thought she was only three months along and come to find out she's six months along and she, this is her first child she does not have anything. And when I say nothing, I do mean nothing. And it's not like they have too much going for them. So if you know of anyone that would like to give any donations toward, we don't know yet what the baby is. She went for the ultrasound, but they couldn't tell. She's got to go to Portland. So that's been another one of my um, duties <laughs> is taking her to the to the doctors and, and helping her with a few things. So I'm, I'm just grateful that I have ability, that I have enough health and strength, and I couldn't have any of these things if it weren't for God. He is my strength. You know the, the verse, I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. And so we have to remember that those things are are important that we remember those wonderful verses. So is there anyone else with a nice, yes, Kim. Okay. Okay, Monica first. Um, what I, uh, I want to praise God for Regina Gosley's life and for the love 
the love um, shown in this church that um, we, that we were willing to pause Sabbath school and pray for me and my great aunt Regina's family. Amen. Amen. Kim? So I want to praise God for his hand of protection. Um, I know that sounds a little odd. Those of you who may or may not know, my mom took a, a fall um, Thursday night. Um, could have been so much worse. Um, she fell. She broke the top of the ball of her shoulder. Asked her if she was trying to keep pace with me. Um, good news is I took her and see my shoulder doc. And it does not look like it will need surgery. It looks Amen. like it's going to heal on its own. Um, about four weeks in a sling, probably. She's currently um, staying with us, which is my other praise. My amazing husband has been an absolute blessing in making sure that mom's taken care of while I'm at work and things like that. So just want to um, praise God for that. Amen. Yes. Okay. And Jackie and then Terry again. I had a quick question first for you about your friend who is pregnant. Should any of us want to make donations? Should we come see you? Yes. About that? Okay. Yes. Oh, thank you. So my praise, um, I think in a lot of ways this year and last year have been pretty overwhelming for a lot of us, especially for Kyle and I in different ways. And so I'm thankful for God for the promise that when our heart is over, it says, when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that's higher than I. And I just, I take so much comfort in that promise that God knows exactly what's going on. He knows our hearts. He knows the end from the beginning and he cherishes us and he values Amen. us. Um, that when we're stressed, we're overwhelmed. Like God is just so willing and ready to take that and to show us something better. Um, and it's been such a great thing to be able to claim that promise. Um, and we get to, at least for me, um, that's something that I hold as a central part of my life coaching work, that when people come to see me, um, I'm very much approaching it from that point. And so I recently, a second praise, had one of my clients become interested in Bible studies. And this is her, like, she's been kind of interested or so for the last 20 years, but this has been a real breakthrough time for her. And so it's likely that we'll start Bible studies. I got to give her a Bible. And so... Um, yeah, God just knows how to comfort us and knows how to allow us to pour into other people when we need it most. So yes. I'm very thankful. Absolutely. Go ahead. I just want to praise God. These last few weeks have been rough on my husband and I. He's been out of work because he had his knee replaced. And he's getting ready to have his shoulder done. But we just celebrated our 45th wedding anniversary. Amen. And I'm so thankful that God has brought us through all our trials and temptations. <laughs> Yes. Amen. Is there anyone else? With that, would you, those that want to kneel, we can kneel. And those that cannot kneel, would you stand while we have prayer? Most kind and loving Father in heaven, great is your faithfulness to us. So many times you are so long suffering with us and we don't deserve it. Help us to give that same love toward those around us who are less than kind toward us. Forgive us for times when we fail you, when we walk in our own willful way or we think we're wise in our own eyes. We want to have our thoughts in sync with your thoughts, our ways to be your ways. So I pray this morning for these wonderful testimonies that the Holy Spirit will take each one and, and bless it and be with those that are seeking after you and hungering and thirsting after righteousness. Give us wisdom, Lord, that we know how to give these studies, that we will do it with compassion and understanding. Be with those, Lord, that walk away. And when we think that they they are interested and then they just walk away and close the door. 
Lord, it's sometimes that's pretty hard on us. And so how much harder it is on you because you gave your life for them. So I ask, Father, that you would help us to love them anyway, to continue to walk in the path that you'd lead us in. I thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your mercies that are new each morning. And I ask a special blessing on those that are needing to be comforted, like Monica and like Bob. We all have suffered many griefs, Lord, in the past. Those that we have loved and lost, but we look forward to that day when the dead in Christ will rise first. And those of us that are left behind will be caught up in the air with them to be with you forever. Oh, Father, I look forward to that day. And I praise you and thank you for the promises of your great love and mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. It's now time for our tithes and offerings. Shall we stand for the doxology? Praise God from Thank you, Father. You are the great provider. You have given so much to us. Thank you that we are able to give back even a small portion of what you have given us. Those that can, have not been able to, Lord, I pray a special blessing that you would help them to be able to financially and spiritually give back to you what's yours and help us that we can give always give back and do for you what is necessary for the kingdom to be to be going forward. For the harvest is ready, Lord. The labors are few, and we want to work for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. It's now time for the kids to come forward. They're going to collect the lamb's offering, and Audrey will have our children's story. I 
Good morning, boys and girls. Good morning. Good morning. Did everybody have a good week? Yeah, good. I'm glad to hear that. So um, something happened a few weeks ago. Do you guys remember? It was like all over the news. The solar eclipse. That's right. Yeah. And um, I just want to bring um, a little bit of attention to that. Um, do you notice... Like normally in our everyday lives, we're busy, we're doing things. A lot of times we're on this, doing this. So a lot of people get very distracted. But that one day, what was everybody doing? Did you guys, did you guys see it? Did any of you guys have like special glasses or anything for it? Yeah? What was everybody doing that day? Were they looking at their phones? Or were they doing this? They were all looking up, weren't they? And all the, the sun, the moon, earth, everything, who made that for us? God did, that's right. So do you think when everybody was looking up at the sun and the moon aligning and everything, that they were looking up and thinking, God made that for us? You think there were a lot of people? Who, who thought about that? Well, I hope that as people were looking up that they were thinking about that. But I want to talk to you about something different. So before, before we had the solar eclipse, we had something else that happened. Does any, can you tell me what happened? Oh, that lovely nor'easter we got. Oh, the few snowflakes that we got? Yeah. Yeah, everybody remembers that too, huh? Yes, so, um, and again, who, who gives us the sun and the rain, the snow? Yeah, God provides all that too. Well, I want to show you guys something. So when it snows, I go over and I help take care of my parents, and I was over there cleaning her car off so we could get ready for a doctor's appointment. And as I'm scraping off her car and shoveling around her car, I saw something, and I want to show you guys what this is. I want to see, can anybody tell me what, what does that look like? Oh, oh, wait a minute. Okay, sorry, I must have touched another button. What does that look like? Okay. Now, okay, you picked up on something right away. That was going to be the second part of the story. But, but let me ask you this. When you guys see icicles, how do icicles usually form? On the roof, they, they form coming down, correct? Well, when you guys look at that icicle, what's different about it? Is it hanging off a roof or off the car? It's, but the icicle itself is formed from the ground coming up. It's not normally how an icicle would form. Normally, like, like we were saying, it normally forms from the rooftop or something like this. But I thought that was pretty incredible. I'm like, I want to take a picture of that. That's kind of awesome that the icicle, instead of hanging off of anything, it's standing there all by its lone self, just sticking up out of the ground, and it was a few inches. But you had picked up on it, Rowan. When I was looking at that, I hadn't even noticed that until I looked at it a little closer. And if you look closer, what do you see? Well, you see the cross, right? 
Okay, well, we're not talking about that. We're talking about church. So we kind of see, so there's this icicle sticking straight up. For those of you who can't see the picture, there's this icicle that's sticking straight up out of the ground. And in the shadow is a cross. And what the funny thing about this, I thought was, do you see two icicles together there? there no, there's only one sticking up out of the ground. So where does that other that other shadow that we see, where does that where is that coming from? No, no, that's the icicle is the only thing that's there. But in the background, there's a little shadow and it shadows across. And I said to myself, how I just thought that was amazing that here I'm looking at this one little icicle, and when I go back and I look at the picture, there's a shadow of a cross when there's only one stem, there's not two. Who, who do you think can do something like that? God, that's right. God does all of these miraculous things, all these miracles, so many things that he's provided for us that sometimes we don't even think about, but we always appreciate it. Like when the solar eclipse happened, we usually don't see the sun and the moon together, but at night we want the moon so we can see and the stars. And how about during the day? Do we need that sun? Yeah. The sun has some benefits for us, not just as it gives us light, but how about warmth? How about vitamin D things? So there's so many things that the Lord provides for us. And I just want us to all be thankful for all the blessings he gives us. And even in these little tiny miracles like this, just a little icicle shooting out of the ground, and then its shadow has a picture. It's, it looks like a cross. So I just wanted to say thank you, God, for all the blessings you've given us and all the miracles, the little ones and the big ones that you perform for us. So can we say a little prayer? Let's say, we're going to say, does anybody want to pray? No? Okay, I'll pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you so much for all the blessings that you have given us. We thank you for the sun, the moon, and the stars, the rain, and the snow, all of the many blessings that sometimes we take for granted, but we always need. We know that you will always take care of us. We thank you for the many blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So I do have a little, a little something I want to give you guys. This is just something so that it will be like a little reminder for you to always remember God. I'm going to take the little pedal out, and it's a little light. So, that's right. That's right. You let that little light of God shine in you. Yes, you can have one. I'm going to give everybody that. That's right. We're going to let that light of God shine inside us. And, oh. And that light that God gives us, so what else does that light do for us as well? That sun. What is, what is this? We said this is a mushroom. How about do we need the sun to grow our food? Yes. How about that? Mushrooms? Do any of you guys like to eat mushrooms? Yes. Yes. I never really was really fond of mushrooms, but then it's like I found out mushrooms have a lot of very good properties that are good for us. Things that we need. So I decided I'm going to start like the mushrooms. And I started to eat mushrooms. And now, so you each have a little light to let that light shine inside of you. Just like that little mushroom is shining, okay? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Always remember God and everything that you provide for us. What's that? I, I'm just going to see I shall see the King where the angels sing. 
I shall see the king someday in a better land on the golden strand and with him shall ever stay in his glory i shall see the king and forever endless praises sing twas on calvary jesus died for me i shall see the king someday in the land of song in the glory throng where there never comes a night with my ward once slain i shall ever reign in the glory land of light in his glory i shall see the king and forever endless praises sing twas on calvary jesus died for me i shall see the king someday I shall see the king all my tributes bring and shall look upon his face then my song shall be how he ransomed me and has kept me by his grace in his glory I shall see the king and forever endless praises sing twas on calvary jesus died for me i shall see the king someday amen you're welcome come on the life to say the scripture Good morning, everybody. Happy Sabbath. This morning's scripture reading will be from Revelation chapter 11, verse 19. It says, Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. And there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, and earthquakes, and great hail. Amen. Loving Father in heaven, I lift up my brother, Matt, right now. And I ask, Lord, that you will speak through him this morning. And that the Holy Spirit will surround him with your strength, with your courage, with your counsel, and with your wisdom. Hide him behind the cross, Lord, and cover him with your blood. I thank you, Lord, for his willing heart to serve you and to work for you endlessly. I praise you for him, and I thank you, Lord, for this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, Jim. Appreciate it. Good morning, everyone. You know, I'm so grateful for the opportunity to serve the Lord, and it's not because I have any worthiness in me. You know, the Lord uh, throughout my life has had to repeatedly teach me the lesson of humility and but I'm grateful for that because you know it's it's by our emptying of self that we can really be filled with the spirit and used to his glory so if that means I have to go a little lower then I'm grateful for the, for that so we'll get right into it I hope you have your bibles ready we're going to do some serious scripture studying this morning I just want to bring you right to <clears throat> um, the opening text, which was, as Brother Braxton read, it was in Revelation. Why don't we turn there?
Revelation chapter 11 and in verse 19. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and a great hail. So I've entitled this message, uh, God's Law Immutable. I didn't invent that title. That's actually uh, a chapter heading in the great controversy. Um, just so we're clear, the word immutable might not be a word that we're uh, you know, frequently accustomed to using, but the word immutable simply means unchangeable, unable to be modified or, or adjusted in any way. And so I thought that it would be important for us to once again reevaluate our position and the importance of why we take this position. And so I want to look at some of the scriptural evidence that we have for why we've come as a denomination to this position and why we cannot come down from it. So as we reflect on this verse, I think it's important to, to recognize the fact that the heaven being spoken of here is an eternal kingdom. And so here we see revealed in scripture that right in the, the heart of heaven, in the holiest of all places, the Ten Commandment law and the Ark of the Testament has been forever, um, has been forever glorified and been in position. You'll note that this verse says that the temple of God was opened in heaven. Well, let's think about that. If if the temple of God was opened, then that would certainly logically dictate that at one point it was closed. Right. In order for it to be an opened, it had to have first been closed. And this word temple, by the way, just to give you a little deeper meaning in the English, it's it's a little bit vague. But the actual word in the Greek is the term naos. Naos is a little bit more succinct than temple. Um, it really is referring to inter, uh, inner sanctum. So it's the portion of the temple which is most holy. And we know, of course, in the in the earthly tabernacle, that the temple, the tabernacle was divided up into two sections. We had the first apartment that we referred to as the holy, and then we have the second apartment that was referred to as the most holy. And so that's what's being referred to here. Now in, in um, I don't want to go too far down this, but just to give a little bit of understanding to this, there are actually two doors that are discussed in, in the book of Revelation referring to heaven and referring to the temple. Um, why don't we at this point turn to our Bibles to Revelation chapter uh, 4. And we will just read from there real briefly. So, you know, in Revelation chapter 4, in, in Revelation 2 and 3, we have the message to the seven churches. We should understand that the seven churches, while they were literal churches, that the message to these churches is, more than to those specific churches, but are really talking about the entirety of the church history from the apostolic ages until the close of time. The number seven is a number that um, constitutes um, completion or fullness or totality. And so in these seven churches, we have counsel uh, through all of the church age. Um, so in, in Revelation chapter four, we read this. After this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Let me submit to you this morning that the door here being referred to is not the door that was discussed in Revelation 11. And I think that that will be clear once we continue reading. It says, and immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the thrones were four and 20 elders. And upon the seats, I saw four and 20 elders sitting clothed in white raiment. And they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So without 
you know, too much more delving into this, we have some evidence of where we're actually looking at in heaven. So again, there's a door being opened. And notice that it says in verse 2, it says, Behold, a throne was set in heaven. So if the throne is being set, what did that, what is logically that mean about that throne? Previously, it had not been set, right? And so what we're seeing is a door is being opened and a throne is being set in place. What really is taking place here is the beginning of the ministration of the, of the temple of God. And this is the beginning of the ministration in particular of the holy place. Now, some other textual evidence that we have that we are in fact in the holy place in this vision is if, if I can draw your attention to verse 5, we see that in, in this temple, there are seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which is much like we see in the, in the uh, Hebrew tabernacle. Okay, let me get back to... So let's, let's investigate this temple a little bit uh, more closely. I invite you now to turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 8. And if I could just get some amens when we're there. All right. All right, so we're all in the Word, and we're looking at Hebrews chapter 8. And the Bible says, starting in verse 1, Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, wherefore it is of necessity that this man have someone also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to this law. And so when Christ walked the earth, he was not walking this earth as a priest. What was, what was the role of Christ when he walked this earth? He was certainly a prophet, and he was our example, and he was our substitute. That was, that was his role while on earth. It goes on in verse 5, and it says that these priests, they serve unto the example and shadow of what? Heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle, for see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. So what was the earthly sanctuary patterned after? The heavenly sanctuary, of which there is a literal heavenly sanctuary, of which Christ is the minister. Let's now turn to Exodus, and we're going to look in verse 25, and we're going to find some more corroborating information regarding this sanctuary. Looking at Exodus chapter 25, and I'd like to draw your attention to verses 8 and 9. God here declares, he says, Let them make me a sanctuary, speaking to the Israelites. Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. What a beautiful thought that the creator of all wants nothing more than to live with his people. That I may dwell among them according to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle. And don't miss this point. In the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. And so the heavenly sanctuary of which the the Mosaic sanctuary was, was a pattern, right? The Mosaic sanctuary doesn't just pattern it in its structure, but also in what? The instruments thereof. That means all of the articles of furniture where it would be the, the, the seven-branch candlestick, the, the uh, altar of incense, and then, of course, the most holy place, the Ark of the Covenant. 
in the earthly, these were patterns of the reality of the heavenly sanctuary. And so when we read in Revelation chapter 11 that the temple of God was opened and there was seen in his temple the Ark of the Testament, what should we expect is in that Ark? That's right. It, as it was with the earthly, so it is in the heavenly. And so let's not miss that point, that in heaven, the Ten Commandment law is forever ensconced. Jesus certainly taught this reality in his earthly ministry. Uh, I think we're all familiar with Matthew chapter 5, which is the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said, Think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Now, the Pharisees at, the, at that time had piled all sorts of rules and regulations, particularly on which commandment? The Sabbath commandment. In fact, they had so bogged down the Sabbath commandment that it became virtually impossible to keep that commandment in accordance with the true focus of its, of its, of, you know, of its uh, establishment. And so Jesus came to, while sweeping away the meaningless requirements that the Pharisees had attached to the Sabbath commandment, he certainly didn't come here to sweep away the Sabbath commandment. In fact, he says, no, think not that I come to destroy the laws. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, will heaven ever pass? No. Will the earth ever pass? Well, you know, the earth will pass into a different state. But remember, the scripture tells us that God made the earth and he did not make it in vain. He made it to be in, 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 uh, inhabited. And remember also that the meek shall inherit what? The earth. And so, what's that, sister? The new earth. The earth made new. But remember, God is going to be taking the old earth and cleansing it and refashioning it into the new. So in a sense, neither heaven or earth will ever pass away. So till heaven and earth shall, shall pass, uh, I, for verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law until all be fulfilled. What's a jot and a tittle? Yeah, that's one way we look at it in our modern vernacular. Go ahead, Monica. You. I was going to say, not in the eye of God. Yeah. You know, that's right. You know, in the Hebrew alphabet, uh, the actual letters that are the symbols of the letters are consonants. The way, in, you know, in English, we have other symbols for vowel sounds. In Hebrew, they do vowels a little differently. Rather than having a letter for vowels, they punctuate the consonants with various types of punctuation marks that, in effect, become, generate the vowel sound. So this is what it's really referring to. And so what is Jesus saying, in effect? That the law is not going to change in the slightest particular, Right? And very well, the psalmist wrote of this when he said in verse uh, in 119, verse 89, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. And we just read in Revelation that the Ark of the Testament and, of course, the, the, the very law of God itself is enshrined there forever. You know, one of the most terrible teachings that has affected the Christian church in general is the teaching of the 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 the, uh, the wrong understanding of the dispensations? Now, clearly, there has been a Jewish dispensation and a Christian dispensation, but what ends up happening is they take this teaching way too far to the effect that they teach that basically God has two standards of righteousness: that God has one standard of righteousness for the Jews, and then a distinct separate of righteousness for Gentiles. But this certainly cannot be. Because what this does is it makes God a liar when he says multiple times in the scripture that he's not a respecter of persons. I can tell you that this doctrine does more to attack the character of God than perhaps any other. And really, you know, it is the doctrine that otherwise Christian and God-fearing people will lean on in their open rebellion against the law of God. So let's take a look now at Romans chapter 2 to sort of drive this point home. I'll invite you to turn to Romans chapter 2, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 5. 
Romans chapter 2, starting in verse 5. But after the hardness and impenitent heart treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. To them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. Okay? So to those that are by patient continuance in well-doing and are seeking for glory and honor and immortality, he will render to them eternal life. Verse 8, but unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but o obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul, upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. So if a Jew is engaged in evil doing, his reward is going to be no different than the Gentile that is engaged in evil doing. And of course, what is the standard for us to decide what is good and what is evil to begin with? Is it not the moral law of God? So if if the if the standard if the standard of righteousness were malleable and changeable, um, how, could, how could God be a consistent God and a just God? He certainly could not. I'll continue. It says, um, verse 10, but, by, but glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good to, Jew, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Verse 11, for God concludes, for there is no respect of persons with God. The same standard of righteousness that God applied to the Jews anciently is the standard of righteousness that he applies to all of humanity. Verse 12, for as many have, as have sinned without the law shall also perish without the law. In other words, those that, are, 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 that have not been enlightened uh, by the specific teachings of the law, they're still going to be held accountable to that same law. And notice what it says. It continues on. It says, and as many as have sinned in the law, in other words, those that know and understand the teachings of the law, what shall they be judged by? They'll be judged by that law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Verse 14, for when the Gentiles which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law. These, having not the law, are a law unto themselves. So, you know, it's very interesting. There are those that might not even really understand the law of God with, with, with complete detail, and yet they are um, pliant to the, 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 the voice of the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit is working in all men. Remember when Jesus said that when, when the Son of Man shall be lifted up, he would draw who? All men unto him. And so that, that working is taking place amongst the, the church and the unchurched. And there are those that are becoming pliant to the Spirit of God and are, bring, are coming into compliance with it without not even realizing it. In fact, the testimony of the Scripture is there will be those that approach Christ in heaven and ask him, where did he get the wounds on his hands? They're not even going to understand the crucifixion, and yet they were, they were submissive to the Spirit of God and were basically safe to save. So verse 14, when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law, these, having not the law, are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience, also bearing witness that their thoughts, uh, the mean which accusing or else accusing one another, the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Now, man in his fallen condition has a problem. The problem that we have is, by nature, um, we hate God. That's the reality of it. We hate God and we hate righteousness by nature. In fact, if we turn... Um, let me take a little detour here. Let's look at Revelation chapter 8 for just a moment. 
We can see this plainly illustrated. So in Revelation chapter 8, we read in verse 7, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Now, I'll tell you today that when Adam was created in his innocence in Eden, he and his wife were perfect before the Lord. And their nature was in perfect harmony with the nature of God. And so by nature, it was their good pleasure to, do, to, to walk in God's law. But when Adam and Eve basically sold out their birthright and came under the influence of the enemy, they yielded obedience to him, and their nature at that point were, was forever changed. And so they basically doomed not only themselves, but all of their children to no longer have the capacity in and of themselves to obey God. And this is precisely why the, the human race so desperately needs a redeemer. We needed a second Adam to come in and to be able to restore to us what had been lost. And so the scripture tells us that whatsoever is not of faith is sin. You know, <clears throat> there are many that have been brought up in, in circumstances where from a young age they may have learned um, the principles of right and wrong uh, outwardly and through just grit and stubborn tenacity give outward appearances that they're walking in the law of God. But the, the scripture tells us that what is soever is not of faith is sin. And so even those that are, are from outward appearances walking in compliance with the law, if it's not being generated by a faith which worketh by love, it's of no avail. Hebrews 11.6 tells us that without, without faith is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You know, the, the testimony of Scripture on this point is so consistent that we really need to have no, no doubt. You know, we could look at Ecclesiastes. I won't have you turn there, but I'll just read it for you. Ecclesiastes verse 12, Solomon uh, concludes his book with this statement. He says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter, Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of the Jew. Ah, but that's not what it says, is it? No. It says, this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. I'll give you a few more. First uh, John chapter 5, in verse 2 and 3 we read, by this, we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. It was the love of God in the creation. It was the love of God from all eternity. It was the love of God for the Jewish nation. It was the love of God for the Christian church, and it's the love of God now. We're warned in Proverbs that he that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be abomination. You know, the, the, the scriptures point to one prevailing reason why God is worthy of our, our eternal honor and worship. It's the fact that he is the creator. You know, I'll give you some examples of this. Let's take a look in Isaiah. A couple of verses on Isaiah I'll share with you. And we'll see that very consistently, God appeals to the very fact that he is the creator and we are his creatures as the reason why honor and obedience are due him by right. In Isaiah chapter 40, verses 25, we read, To whom then will ye liken me, or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high, and behold, who hath created these things, that bringeth out their host by number. He calleth them all by names, by the greatness of his might, for he is strong in power, not one faileth. 
Why sayest, O Jacob, and speakest, O Israel, my way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over from my God? Hast thou not known? Hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary? There is no searching of his understanding. It's a glorious God indeed that we serve. Uh, we can look forward a little bit more to Isaiah 45. And this is a beautiful statement. And this is Isaiah 45, starting in verse 17. We read, But Israel shall be saved in the Lord with an everlasting salvation. What a beautiful, what a beautiful um, truth. And, you know, I'm here to tell you today, that nowhere in, in the scripture do we see that God makes a covenant with anybody else but Israel. Did you know that? God does not make a covenant with Gentiles. He makes a covenant with Israel. And pr the promise of salvation is exclusively to Israel. Let's continue, you know, and I'm not going to get into that too deeply today, but if, if you're curious about that, I have prepared a second sermon that I will be speaking uh, specifically about Israel. But just for the purposes of today, I'm going to just say this. Israel, in effect, is not a nation over in Palestine. It's not even a spiritual people. Here's the reality of it. Israel, the title of Israel, which means prince, overcomer that rules with God, applies to only one being in the whole universe, can rightly claim that title, and that's Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ is Israel. And so when we become a part of Israel, it's because we have been grafted into Christ. And that, was, that has been true for time immortal. I'm just going to share a couple more. Well, you know, for the sake of time, I guess I won't. But I'm going to skip it. And again, I brought this up in Revelation chapter 4. Just again, to hit this, notice that those in that throne room uh, with God, the four and tw uh, 20 elders, they fell down to worship him. Why? In verse 11, it says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive honor and glory and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure were they, were, were they created. We're all very familiar with um, the three angels' messages, Revelation chapter 14. You know, again, we see that God is appealed to in the final hours of this history. We know that the three angels' message is the last message of warning that's going out to the fallen earth. Because as we continue reading in Revelation, we see the very next event that takes place after the giving of the three angels' messages is the, the reaping of, of, at his second coming. But it says again, Revelation chapter 14, verse 6, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea, and the fountains of waters. So this last call out to the human race at the end of time is a call and an appeal to return to the rightful worship of God as creator. You know, there is no other institution that has been given to man that so forcefully makes this declaration as the Sabbath. The Sabbath, though it was instituted in Eden, it, it, you know, we are told in, in the writings of Ellen White that if the Sabbath commandment had never been forgotten, there never would have been an infidel. There never would have been a rebellion in, in, uh, in mankind. It would have preserved the knowledge of God universally. And it's really because of the wearing down of that commandment in particular that the world has lost, lost sight of their creator. And so God has raised us up as Seventh-day Adventists in this last hour of Earth's history to, to awaken and arouse the world to a return to, uh, you know, a worship of their creator. Um, I'm going to skip through a little bit of this. Speaking of the Advent people and our, in our mission in Isaiah 58, we read the following, and this is Isaiah 58, starting in verse 12. And they shall be of thee, and they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places, 
Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations and shall be called the repairer of the breach, restorer of paths to dwell in. And, you know, just so we can understand the context, the prophet continues, if thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable and shall honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words, then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. And what is the heritage of Jacob? It is the promise of eternal life in the earth made new. And what is the what is the breach? What what has been breached? It's not is it not the law of God? You know, isn't it sad that the very commandment that God specifically told us to remember is the one that the Christian world has forgotten? As usual, I have way too much material, so I'm going to skim through some of this. <laughs> Um, okay, so I wanted to just, again, um, point out some texts that show that God, again, God is not a, a respecter of persons. He doesn't have one standard of righteousness for the Jews and one for the Gentiles. It's just totally wrong. And we see that this is consistent throughout all Scripture. Um, for example, in Revelation, uh, excuse me, in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 30, 33 and 34, it's in that portion, but I'll just read it. It says, uh, again, Leviticus 19, and I'm starting in verse 30 here. It says, ye shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. Verse 33, and if a stranger sojourn with thee in the land, ye shall not vex him. So what would be a stranger sojourning in the land? Other, other translations beside the King James will br bring it out very clearly that this is speaking of the Gentiles, speaking of those that were not among the, the, uh, the Israelite nation. But notice what God says here. It says, but if the stranger that dwelleth with, with you shall, uh, that dwelleth with you shall be unto you as one born among you. And thou shalt love him as thyself. For thou were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Right? Um, I'm going to skip through some of this. <laughs> well, I'll read this one. So this is from, um, you know, this is from Numbers chapter 15. And boy, I'll tell you, this is, if you really want to get an impression of how strongly the Lord feels about uh, the violation of the Sabbath commandment. I don't know of a stronger one than this. This is in Numbers chapter 15, starting in verse 32. And when the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man that gathered sticks upon the Sabbath day. And they that found him gathering sticks brought him unto Moses and Aaron and said unto all the congregation, and they put him in a ward because it was not declared what should be done to him. And the Lord said to Moses, the man shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones without the camp. And all the congregation brought him without the camp and stoned him with stones, and he died as the Lord commanded Moses. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel and bid them, that they make them fringes on the borders of their garments throughout their generations, that they may put upon the fringe of the borders a ribbon of blue, and it shall be unto you for a fringe that ye may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them, and that ye seek not after your own heart or your own eyes after which ye used to go a-whoring that ye may remember and do all my commandments and be holy unto your God. I am the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord your God. So, you know, and I'm here to tell you today 
that it is no less offensive to the Lord violations of the Sabbath in this late hour in Earth's history as it was anciently. It's no less offensive to him. Um, I'm going to spend the, the last bit of my time here. I wanted to share with you a testimony that I <clears throat> discovered just recently. And I got to tell you, when I read this testimony, I've been a Seventh-day Adventist for about 20 years, and I certainly have done everything in my power to observe the Sabbath. But, you know, after I read this, I'm going to tell you, it really shook me to my core. And, you know, I think that, um, I think that it would do well for us to hear this. So I'm reading from Testimonies of the Church, Volume 4. This is a, a testimony in, entitled, The Sacredness of God's Commandments. And, um, you know, they've omitted the name of the actual person that this was addressed to, so I'm just going to put my name in there. I'm going to make this personal. Um, so the letter goes like this. Much respected brother Matt. In January 1875, I was shown that there are hindrances in the way of the spiritual prosperity of the church. The Spirit of God is grieved because many are not right in heart and life. Their professed faith does not harmonize with their works. The sacred rest day of Jehovah is not observed as it should be. Every week, God is robbed by some infringement upon the borders of his holy time and the hours that should be devoted to prayer and meditation are given to worldly employments. God has given us his commandments not only to be believed in, but to be obeyed. The great Jehovah, when he had laid the foundations of the earth, had dressed the whole world in the garb of beauty and had filled it with wonderful things useful to man. And when he created all the wonders of the land and the sea, instituted the Sabbath day and made it holy. God blessed and sanctified the Sabbath day because he rested upon it from all his wondrous works of creation. The Sabbath was made for man, and God would have put would have him put by his labor, uh, excuse me, and God would have him put by his labor on that day as he himself rested after his six days of working of creation. Those who reverence the commandments of Jehovah will after light has been given them in reference to the fourth precept of the Decalogue, obey it without questioning the feasibility or convenience of such obedience. God made man in his own image and then gave him an example of observing the seventh day, which he sanctified and made holy. He designed that upon that day, man should worship him and engage in no secular pursuits. No one who disregards the fourth commandment after becoming enlightened concerning the claims of the Sabbath can be held guiltless in the sight of God. Brother Matt, you acknowledge the requirements of God to keep the Sabbath, but your work does not harmonize with your declared faith. You give your influence to the side of the unbeliever insofar as you transgress the law of God. When your temporal circumstances seem to require attention, you violate the fourth commandment without compunction. You make the keeping of God's law a matter of convenience, obeying or disobeying as your business or inclination indicates. This is not honoring the Sabbath as a sacred institution. You grieve the Spirit of God and you dishonor your Redeemer by pursuing this reckless course. Boy, I don't know that I would have wanted to receive this letter. A partial observance of the Sabbath law is not accepted by the Lord and has a worse effect upon the minds of sinners than if you made no profession of being a Sabbath keeper. They perceive that your life contradicts your belief and lose faith in Christianity. The Lord means what he says, and man cannot set aside his commands with impunity. The example of Adam and Eve in the garden should sufficiently warn us against any disobedience of the divine law. The sin of our first parents in listening to the spacious temptations of the enemy brought guilt and sorrow upon the world and led the Son of God to leave the royal courts of heaven and take a humble place on earth. He was subjected to insult, 
rejection, and crucifixion by the very ones he came to bless. What infinite expense attended that disobedience in the Garden of Eden. The majesty of heaven was sacrificed to save man from the penalty of his crime. God will not pass over any transgression of his law more lightly now than in the day when he pronounced judgment against Adam. The Savior of the world raises his voice in protest against those who regard the divine commandments with carelessness and indifference. Said he, whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. The teaching of our lives is wholly for or against the truth. Whew. Tell you, this slays me. If your work seem to justify the transgressor in his sin, if your influence makes light of breaking the commandments of God, then you are not only guilty yourself, but you are, in a certain extent, responsible for the consequent errors of others. Wow. At the beginning of the fourth precept, God said, remember. Knowing that man in the multitude of his cares and perplexities would be tempted to, to excuse himself from meeting the full requirements of the law, or in the press of worldly business to forget its sacred importance, six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, the usual business of life for worldly profit or pleasure. These words are very explicit. There can be no mistake. Brother Matt, how dare you venture to transgress a commandment so solemn and important? Has the Lord made an exception by which you were absolved from the law he has given to the world? Are your transgressions omitted from the book of record? Has he agreed to excuse your disobedience when the nations come before him for judgment? Do not for a moment deceive yourselves with the thought that your sin will not bring its merited punishment. Your transgressions will be visited with the rod because you have had the light, yet you walked directly contrary to it. That servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. You know, there's a, there's a fearful responsibility in being a Seventh-day Adventist. Because as much blessing that comes in the knowledge of the truth, with it comes a solemn and awesome responsibility that we do well not to make life. What's that? I'm reading from Testimonies to Church, Volume 4. It's entitled, Sacredness of God's Commandments. All right, I'm going to finish up here. God has given man six days in which to do his own work and to carry on the usual business of life. But he claims one day, which he has set apart and sanctified. He gives it to man as a day in which he may rest from labor and devote himself to worship and the improvement of his spiritual condition. I don't know about you guys, but I desperately need to improve my spiritual condition. And I'm grateful for this testimony, as hard as it is to hear. What a flagrant outrage it is for man to steal the one sanctified day of Jehovah and appropriate it to his own selfish purposes. It is the grossest presumption for, moral, for mortal man to venture upon a compromise with the Almighty in order to secure his own petty temporal interests. It is, a ruthless, it, is a, it is as ruthless a violation of the law to occasionally use the Sabbath for sexual, uh, secular business as to entirely reject it. For it is making the Lord's commandments a matter of convenience. I am the Lord thy God, and I am a jealous God, is thundered from Sinai. No partial obedience or divided interest is accepted by him who declares that iniquity, the iniquities of the fathers shall be visited upon the children to the third and fourth generation of them that hate him, and that he will show mercy unto thousands of them that love him and keep his commandments. You know, I got to tell you, brothers and sisters, bringing children in this world and seeing my children partake in my errors has been so humbling for me. You know, because it's, you know, 
I know that in my wicked condition, and I'm sure I speak for many of you, you know, we don't lo even love ourselves enough to re avail ourselves of the privileges of, of the gospel. And yet, you know, when I look to my children, I think, wow, this isn't just about me. This is about everybody within my circle of influence that I am that I'm encouraging to be at, at war with God. May it be far from us. It is not a small matter to rob a neighbor, and great is the stigma attached to one who is found guilty of such an act. Yet he who would scorn to defraud his fellow man will without shame rob his heavenly father of the time that he is blessed and set aside for a special purpose. My dear brother, your works are at variance with your professed faith, and your only excuse is the poor plea of convenience. The servants of God in past times have been called to lay down their lives in vindication of their faith. Your course illy har harmonizes with that of the Christian martyrs who suffered hunger and thirst, torture and death, rather than renounce their religion or yield the principles of truth. It is written, what doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he shall have faith and not works? Can faith save him? Every time you put your hand to labor on the Sabbath day, you virtually deny your faith. The Holy Scriptures teach us that faith without works is dead and that the testimony of one's life proclaims to the world whether he be is true to the faith he professes. Your conduct lessens God's law in the estimation of your worldly friends. It says to them, you may or may not obey the commandments. I believe that the law of God is in a manner binding upon men, but after all, the Lord is not very particular as to strict obedience to its precepts. And an occasional transgression is not visited with severity on his part. Many excuse themselves for violating the Sabbath by referring to your example. Wow. They argue that if so good a man who believes the seventh day is a Sabbath can engage in worldly employments on that day, when circumstances seem to require it, they can do the same without condemnation. Many souls will face you in the judgment, making your influence an excuse for their disobedience of God's law. Although this will be no apology for their sin, yet it will tell fearfully against you. God has spoken, and he means that man shall obey. He does not inquire if it is convenient for him to do so. The Lord of life and glory did not consult his convenience or pleasure when he left his station of high command to become a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, accepting ignominy and death in order to deliver man from the consequence of his disobedience. Jesus died not to save man in his sins, but from his sins. Man is to leave the error of his ways to follow the example of Christ, to take up his cross and follow him, denying self and obeying God at any cost. Jesus said no man can serve two masters. He will either hate the one and love the other, or he will hold to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. If we are true servants of God, there should be no question in our minds as to whether we will obey his commandments or consult our own temporal interests. If the believers in the truth are not sustained by their faith in these comparatively peaceful days, what will uphold them when the grand test comes and the decree goes forth from all who will not worship the image of the beast and receive his mark in their foreheads or on their hands? This solemn period is not far off. And I'll submit to you that it's much closer than it was when she first penned this, right? This solemn period is not far off. Instead of becoming weak and irresol in, uh, irresolute, the people of God should be gathering strength and courage for the time of trouble. I guess I'm going to skip some of this because... I think we're getting the point. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll read the final page and we'll conclude. The Savior asked his disciples who were pressed with poverty why they were anxious and troubled in regard to what they should eat or how they should be clothed. 
said he, Behold, the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? He pointed to the lovely flowers formed and tinted by the divine hand, and saying, Why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which is today and tomorrow is cast in the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Where is the faith of God's people? Why are they so unbelieving and distrustful of him? who provides for their wants and upholds them by his strength. The Lord will test the faith of his people. He will send rebukes, which will be followed by afflictions if these warnings are not heeded. He will break the fatal lethargy of sin at any cost to those who have departed from their allegiance to him and awaken them to their sense of duty. My brother, your soul must be quickened and your faith enlarged. You have so long excused yourself in your disobedience by one plea or another that your conscience has become lulled to rest and ceases to remind you of your errors. You have so long followed your own convenience in regard to the keeping of the Sabbath that your mind has been rendered unimpressionable as to your course of disobedience, yet you are nonetheless responsible for you have brought yourself into this condition. Begin at once to obey the divine commandments and trust in God. You know, I'm grateful that that's really the remedy to our problem today, is that at any moment we can make the decision to turn it back around, and God will receive us. Begin at once to obey the divine commandments and trust in God. Provoke not his wrath, lest he visit you with terrible punishment. Return to him before it is too late, and find pardon for your transgressions. He is rich and abundant in mercies. He will give you peace and approbation if you come to him in humble faith. You know, I know this message was a little strong this morning. I just, I had it on my heart. It's as much to me as it is to anybody else. But I just want to encourage every one of you that let's make this year the time that we're going to reconsecrate ourselves fully to the Lord and that we will take hold of the Sabbath truth and we will proclaim it proudly before the world. Um, you know, there's coming a time and hour when many of our members are going to lose faith and be drawn away. Let it not be said in this congregation. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we know that you have called us to comfort the afflicted, but there are times when we must afflict the comfortable, particularly when we're the ones. And Lord, this is the hour in earth's history when your holy place, your most holy place has been opened in heaven. We are living in the very hour of the great atonement. This is a time of deep self-reflection, Lord when the question on all of our hearts should not be pointing around the finger at those around us, but we need to be asking the question, is it I, Lord? Lord, I just pray that you'll go deep in our hearts and minds this Sabbath. Lord, I just pray that you will awaken with us an impression of how lovely and perfect your character is and how much you love us. And that you will draw us and in, into compliance with your word, not out of fear, Lord, but out of a sense of responsibility to you for how good you are and how worthy you are for our service. Lord, I just pray that you will uh, strengthen our faith and that you will help us to walk perfectly in your law. We know that we can't do it in our own, Lord. We must be joined to you. And so, Lord, we just ask that you'll fill us, that we might be perfect representations of your perfect will before the world. Please dismiss us now with your blessing and uh, prepare us for the week ahead. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. A closing hymn is hymn number 554.
shall we stand. Jackie has an announcement. Just really quick, we're going to cancel our essential oils with Kim class today, um, and we'll resume at another time. So just be listening for that announcement when we decide to have it. So no potluck after this, and we'll move the date to another time. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Sorry. Right. Yeah. Wow. That's we're good. No, we're good. <laughs> Same for... 